Go ahead. Good afternoon. It is my distinct privilege today to introduce to you two very important people that are here today. The first is Dr. Lewis Foreman. I think many of you may know him already. He's a psychiatrist who practices here in Kansas City and has done so for many years. And it is through the devotion to him that uh, many of his friends have, over the years, uh, put together a fund which is able to support a lectureship each year in Kansas City. It's been running since 1980. This year, I had the honor of being asked to chair that committee. And in talking with Lou about who we should invite, he came up with I, what I think is a brilliant suggestion. And that is that an old friend of his from many years ago, indeed an Army buddy, uh, with whom he served in the United States Army for three years, is Dr. Ed Rosenbaum. Dr. Rosenbaum uh, was an internist for many years in Portland, Oregon, but developed uh, an illness of his own and wrote a book about it, which was eventually made into a movie. And I think that many of you, if not all of you, have seen the movie, The Doctor. And the book is also available. And it's different, but similar. And I highly recommend that you read it. Dr. Rosenbaum was born in Omaha, Nebraska, so he is a Midwesterner. He attended Creighton University and obtained his medical degree at University of Nebraska, where he was elected to AOA. After serving an internship in the Jewish Medical Hospital in St. Louis, he became a resident in metabolic diseases at the Michael Reese Hospital in Chicago. In 1940, Dr. Rosenbaum went on to the Mayo Clinic and uh, received a master's degree of science in medicine uh, in 1946. However, his studies were interrupted, as I said earlier, by World War II. He entered the uh, service as a first lieutenant in the medical corps in August of 1940 and served on the first MASH unit that the Army put together along with Dr. Foreman. Lou, you might identify yourself. I do want to honor you today because there are many of us in the audience uh, who respect and love you and uh, we're very glad that you're here and that we could have your friend Ed as well. They served in both North Africa, Sicily and France and uh, in fact Dr. Rosenbaum was given a bronze star by the United States Army for meritorious service. He settled in Portland as I said and had a private practice but also founded and headed the rheumatology clinic at the Oregon Health Sciences Center. As I've said before, the experiences that Dr. Rosenbaum had allowed him to write a book that has enriched the lives of all of us, I believe. It certainly will after the next hour has transpired. And I don't want to take any more of Dr. Rosenbaum's time. And so it's with great pleasure that I introduce to you Dr. Ed Rosenbaum. Thank you. Be before I begin, I want to know a little bit about you. How many of you have seen the movie? How many of you have read the book? Well, it's very important that you read the book. That's where I get my royalties. <laughs> now, the other interesting thing is that there's a tremendous difference between the movie and the book. As you can see in the movie, I'm 40 years old, I have hair, I'm a cardiac surgeon, in the movie in San Francisco, and I have trouble with my family life. <coughs> in real life, I live in Portland, Oregon. I'm much older than 40. I have a very happy married life. We've been married for 51 years, and I have four sons. I think it's appropriate that I'm giving this lecture today in honor of Lou Foreman. I met Lewis and Phyllis Foreman in 1940 in Cheyenne. We served together in the military service. And I'll never forget during the campaign in France the mortality among battalion surgeons was high and Louis was selected from us to go forward. We were about five miles behind the front. And I'll never forget that day he left 
with his combat boots, his steel helmet, and his pack. And I don't think we ever expected to see each other again. So it's rather appropriate that 50 years later I'm here. What I'm going to talk to you about today is an illness I had, why I wrote the book about that illness, how it was made into a movie, and what I learned from that experience. Eight years ago, I became hoarse. And my wife said, why don't you go see a doctor? And I said, you know, I don't believe in those guys. <laughs> but, I, but I had to go see the doctor because she made the appointment. And he treated me the way one doctor should treat another. He took me out of turn. He didn't send me a bill. He told me what I wanted to hear. He examined me and said, there's nothing wrong with you. Go home and take some penicillin and steam. So I went home, and I didn't take the penicillin, I didn't steam, and I didn't get any better. But I was sitting in the hospital cafeteria, and there was a second nose and throat specialist. And I grabbed him by the arm, and I said, let's go up to your office, and let's take a look and see why I can't talk. So he went up to his office, and he looked at my throat, and he said, there's nothing wrong with you. Why don't you take the penicillin? But I didn't get better, so I went back to the first doctor, and he said, Ed, We'll put you in the hospital, we'll put you to sleep, we'll do a biopsy, we'll find out what's wrong with you. So they took me to the hospital where I'd worked for 40 years. They gave me a general anesthetic. When I awoke, everybody was laughing and smiling and happy. There's nothing wrong with you, you've got a benign polyp, go back to work. And I went back to work and my patients couldn't understand me. I was hoarse and they said, Dr. Ed, we're worried about you. And I said, you don't have to worry about me. I've been to two doctors, I've had a second opinion, so what's there to worry about? But I didn't get better. So I called the operating doctor and he said, Ed, let's face it, you're getting older. I'm gonna send you to the speech therapy clinic at the medical school. Now, I don't know how many of you have been to the speech therapy clinic, but if you go there, you see a lot of kids with cleft palates, a lot of old guys with strokes. And I said, I don't belong here, I'm leaving. The head technician had been a patient of mine. I treated her for 20 years for rheumatoid arthritis. I hadn't done a damn thing for her, but she grabbed a hold of me and said, hey, no, you gotta stay here, I'm gonna help you. So she took me back to her office and she said, you're very tense, and I wasn't. It was a very happy period of my life, but you don't like to upset your caregiver. So I said, yeah, I'm tense. And she said, I'll teach you how to relax. And she gave me relaxation therapy and that went on for a couple of weeks. And then I came to the clinic one day and the head of the clinic was there and he's a doctor and I said, what are you doing here? I didn't send for you. He said, we're gonna take motion pictures of your vocal cords and we'll see why you can't talk. So it's just like you see in the movie, he put the camera down my throat, he projected it on the television screen, and I was enough of a doctor to see that I had cancer. Now for 50 years I had practiced medicine. I would told patients they had cancer, that was my job, but I as a doctor was immune. But for the first time in my life, I knew the impact of the diagnosis. I didn't want to show my emotions, I walked out of the room and I collapsed on the floor. An aide picked me up and I went quickly to the telephone and called my wife, told her the diagnosis and hung up. I didn't want her reaction. I called my office and my receptionist answered and when I told her what was going on, she, I could hear her starting to cry so I hung up. And then I looked, it was noon. Every day at noon I have lunch with my partner. So I went down to the office and had lunch. And they were all doctors, they didn't know what to say to me. Then I said, looked at my watch, it was one o'clock. Well, I've got patients to see. So I saw patients the rest of the afternoon. They can't get along without me. And then I went home. And my sons who are doctors all came to see me and they didn't know what to say. We all said goodbye to each other. One son, Jimmy, the second one said, Dad, I looked it up in the literature. There's an 85% cure rate with this type of cancer. And I said, Jim, that's a 15% mortality. You see, that's where I had my focus. And I said, you wouldn't subject a patient to surgery with that mortality. Shortly thereafter, I was started on radiation therapy. I didn't have any input into it. That's what my doctor selected. And I, they gave me what they call the linear accelerator. They'd shoot 15 seconds of beam on one side, then the other side, so I wouldn't get a skin burn, 30 seconds altogether. And the treatment would only take a couple minutes. So the first four days, the treatment went very well. On the fifth day, I started to leave, and the receptionist said, hey, you can't leave today. And I said, why not? She said, today is Tuesday. Tuesday is the most important day of the week. That's the day the doctor sees patients. I said, that's a good idea. I want to see the doctor. She put me in a cubicle, put my chart on the door, 11 o'clock. 11.30, I came out in the hallway, was walking around. 
The receptionist says, oh, look, don't be impatient. The doctor is very busy today. This is a very important day. Go back and sit down. <laughs> so I came out at noon and I was hungry and I tightened my belt and I said, gee, the doctor hasn't seen me yet. It's an hour. And she said, he hasn't seen you yet. Oh my God, he must have forgotten you. He went to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> now when I tell that story, newspaper people in particular become very bitter and they say, didn't you want to sue for malpractice? <laughs> and I, 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 they don't understand when I say, no, I didn't. And the reason I didn't is because I, as a doctor, had missed plenty of early diagnosis of cancer. And I, as a doctor, when it came to keeping patients waiting, was the worst in the world. I'd been in practice for only a few years when my receptionist said, Mrs. Lewis, the wife of the chief of medicine at the medical school, is here to see you. Well, how flattered can, be, can you be? A young internist, and the chief sends his own wife. I wasn't going to keep her waiting. I escorted her personally into my consultation room. I examined her for what I thought was a minor complaint, but I thought I did a good job. That was 2 o'clock in the afternoon. At 5 o'clock in the afternoon, there was still one patient waiting in the waiting room. So I went and said to her, pardon me, who are you? She says, I'm Mrs. Lewis. You see, she was the real Mrs. Lewis, and she'd been waiting for three hours. <laughs> On about the 20th day of treatment, I told you I was getting the linear accelerator for 30 seconds, and there'd been, that machine has to be calibrated by a physicist. And there'd been an article in the paper where the machine had been miscalibrated in my own state in Oregon and also in Canada. And in both instances, two million volts of electricity had been shot through the patient and the patient had died on the table. Well, I decided that was going to happen to me and I didn't trust anyone. So when I'd lay down on that table, I'd start counting one, two, because when I was going to get to 30, I was going to be off that table no matter what was happening. <laughs> Well, this, this day I got to 20 and the lights went on, the whistles blew, the technician rushed into the room and I said, my God, what happened? The technician said, the tube blew. I said, the tube blew, that means I don't have a chance because I can't continue my treatment. He says, I know it, he says, it's tough, but he says, that tube has been on its last legs for the last month. I've been begging the department to replace it, but they're too damn cheap and they wait till the last minute. I said, what's going to happen now? He said, well, try to ship one in by air, come back tomorrow, maybe we'll be lucky. I came back the next day, the treatment went bang, bang, no trouble. So I said to him, what happened yesterday? He said, well, I made a mistake, I pushed the wrong button. And then he said, but I want to level with you. He said, you're getting the wrong treatment. You're getting the same treatment you'd get if you'd gone to Stanford. If you'd been smart, you'd have gone to MD Anderson in Houston and gotten a better treatment. And I tell you that story, because in my day as a doctor, we were a cottage industry. It was a one-on-one -on -one relationship. That's no longer true today. We're a team. And if there's one rotten member of the team, the whole thing falls apart. In this particular case, I knew what was going on. He had been overpassed for promotion. But imagine the impact that would have on a layperson who didn't know what was going on. Now, like, everyone, like so many people who've had a cancer and have had treatment and think maybe they are going to make it, I decided to write a book. And I sent the book in, I completed it. It was a very clinical book about what had happened to me. And like everyone else, it was promptly rejected. But the editor wrote to me and said, you do have some talents, why don't you start all over again? And she gave me some ideas and I started all over again. And I sent in 19 pages and the editor called me up very excited and said, I think you've got an idea here and we're going to give you an advance and we're going to publish you. So they gave me a nice advance and I think what got them was a story I put in there. And this was a true story. Most of the stories in my book are true stories. All of them are. I was working in a hospital emergency room on Saturday night. You all know what that's like. It's chaos. In this particular hospital, they'd put the patients in cubicles and put their charts by the cubicles. And an elderly gentleman had come in and he was lying on the table. His chart was on his cubicle. I took his chart down. I was going to see him. And the nurse said, wait a minute, doctor. Don't see him. I haven't gotten to his vitals yet. And the old man jumps off the table and he goes like this and he says, there's no way that girl's going to get nearest than me. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Now the interesting thing to me is this, that I am not the first doctor that has written about his illness or her illness. Forty years ago, a book appeared called Doctors and Their Illnesses. In this book, 15 doctors all describe terminal illnesses. Nothing can be done for them, but yet they have nothing but nice things to say about their treating doctor. The same time my book appeared, 40 years later, a new edition of the book appeared, Doctors and Their Illnesses. In this book, we have 15 different doctors all writing about serious illnesses. Now, because of the advance in medicine, 50% of them can be helped. And yet 50% of them are very bitter about the way their colleagues have treated them. And the question that I raise with medical groups is this, why is it at a time when we as doctors can do more for our patients than we ever could before, is our public image diminishing? I don't know all the answers. One of the answers, of course, is that we have created unrealistic expectations on the part of the public. They expect us to cure everything. <clears throat> the other thing is this, that we as physicians are isolated from society. Stop and think what is happening to you and what has, has happened to you. When you decided to go on med to medical school, you already took a different course. You dropped the arts and the humanities. In this particular school, I understand you go directly from high school into medical school. Half your colleagues have dropped by the way. And what do you do among your first duties in medical school? You go into the anatomy laboratory. And there the corpses are wrapped in bandages and gauze and soaking in formaldehyde. And you remove that bandage and you stick a knife in that body. And that is not a normal human act. And from that point on, you are isolated from society. And stop and look at ourselves. As a group, we tend to be introverted, compulsive. We socialize only among ourselves. And unquestionably, we are in a different economic group than most of society. Even our humor is different. I would write stories for my book that I thought were absolutely hilarious. And my editor rejected them. She said, I don't want people to think you're that bad. <laughs> now, I'm going to give you an example of that. And you're, most of you aren't practicing physicians, but when you're in practice, you'll relate to this, because this happens to every doctor. Mrs. Perlman comes in to see me, and she says, I've been coming to see you for 30 years, and I'm still no better. And you never give me enough time. I said, look, go home. Write down all your questions, put all your medicines in a bag, come back next month, I'll give you all the time you need. She comes back the next month with a brown bag full of medication, a list of questions. I take the first vial out, I look at it, I said, you don't need this, I throw it in the wastebasket. She said, wait a minute, doctor, that's the last prescription you gave me, it cost $60 or 30 tablets, and I only took one tablet. I said, uh oh, so I quick take it out of the way. <laughs> I take it out of the wastebasket, I dust it off, I put it on the desk, I said, we're gonna give this to some poor person. I go through all her medications, I end up with one vial, I said, this is all you have to take, this pill. She says, how often? One, three times a day. Before meals or after meals? I tell her, after meals. She said, what'll I do? I don't eat lunch. <laughs> I, I told that story to a group of senior citizens in San Jose, and an old man came up to me and he said, I went to a very smart doctor, and he knew how to solve that problem for me. I said, well, how did he solve the problem? He said, he told me, pretend you eat lunch. <laughs> the other story, and I don't dare tell this to non-medical groups, but it's true. We were sitting around the dinner table. My son, Richard, who's a neurologist, his wife, Lois, who's an attorney. And I said, Richard, I want to tell you what I read today in a medical journal. It seems that the patient died and the body was removed, but they did not remove the chart from the nursing station. So duly recorded in that chart for f the next 48 hours was the patient's general condition, temperature, pulse, and respiration. <laughs> now, you won't believe that, but that does happen. And we as doctors laugh at it because we know that now almost the record has become more important than the patient. 
to the attorney, that was gruesome. Now you probably all wonder, how could a movie about a 70-year-old rheumatologist with throat cancer, how could a book about a, about a 70-year-old rheumatologist with throat cancer possibly become a movie? What happened is that the publisher sent out what they called galley proofs to people that they thought might be interesting, and the editor called me out one day, very excited. She said, the Walt Disney people want to buy the rights to make a movie out of your book, but let me explain it to you. They don't really give you any real money. They take what they call an option. So they only give you about five or 10% of the money, and they'll buy hundreds of scripts, and there isn't one chance in 100 that your book is going to go to a movie. But what do you care? Take the option money and run. Well, you haven't lost anything. So we signed the option rights with the Walt Disney people. And then my wife and I, we were on a book tour, publicity tour, and we were in LA, and we got a call from the studio that they'd like to take us to dinner. And I said, what for? And they said, we want to meet you, and we want you to see that we're ordinary people, not Hollywood types. So we had dinner that night with Adam Leipzig, who's the producer for Disney, and we met Laura Ziskin, who is the final movie producer. And we learned our first lesson about Hollywood. No one is assigned a project. These scripts are lying around. You as an actor or a producer have to say, I can relate to this. This is something I want to do. And Laura Ziskin signed up right away. Now, nothing much happened for a while because a writer's strike was on. And then I got a call one day. We've hired a writer, Robert Caswell. Robert Caswell is an Australian. He was very popular on Australian television. He'd never done anything in America. But they said, we've hired Robert Caswell. The next thing I knew, Robert Caswell called me up. He came to Portland. I met him as he got off the plane. He said, I've been sent here by Disney. We're there at their expense. What's the most expensive place in town to eat? <laughs> so we had lunch together. And he said, no, I'm going to come to, um, first of all, I'm going to make you 40 years younger. And you all see that in the movie. And he said, I'm going to come to Portland and immerse myself in your environment so I'll see what you're like. And he left, and the, that's the last I saw Robert Caswell. <laughs> About a year later, I got a call from the studio that they had a script, and they wanted to know if I would like to see it, and I said yes, and they sent me the script, and I didn't recognize my book. And I thought it was terrible. You see, I had a problem, though, because unless they made a movie of it, I didn't get paid. So I called them up, and I said, hey, this is the best script I ever read. <laughs> But you, you see, I, I, I wasn't lying because I'd never read a script before. <laughs> and then they <clears throat> continued to send me two or more scripts, and they got a lot better. And then they said, would you like to come down to have a script conference? And I said, of course. So we got the first class Hollywood treatment. They sent flowers and limousines and chauffeurs and first class tickets and a suite. And I get to Hollywood, and I call them up, and I say, I'm here, ready to go to business. And they say, uh, no, first we have to have lunch. So they take us out to lunch, and then they said, would you like to see the movie set? See, the movie takes place in San Francisco. The set is actually in Los Angeles. We didn't know they were building a set there, but they took us out on the set. And the set you see is built in a 56,000 square foot warehouse. The hospital is 46,000 square feet. It's made entirely of Formica, even the floor, to give it a high-tech gloss look. To build that set cost a million two. And in that set, there are $5 million worth of technical equipment on loan. Now, I don't know how many of you are married and what you think, but I, I believe, fellas, that wives ought to do as they're told. Fortunately for me, why, my wife doesn't agree with me. So as we were going through the set, she said to one of the young producers, why don't you use Dr. Ed in the movie? He'd be a natural. So when we met for dinner that night, one of the producers said to me, we're going to use you in the movie. And I thought they were kidding. And he said, no, you'll have to join the union. And if you get a walk-on part, we can give you $100. That's union scale. If you have some lines, we can pay you $431. So we'll have to give you some lines. I thought they were kidding. And we went home. I got a call a month later to hurry up, come back down right away on a Sunday, we came down Sunday night. Monday we spent on the set, and they said, now the next day you have to get up at 5.30 because we're gonna film you. And Tuesday we come on the set at 6.30, and there's a big trailer and a big star on the trailer, and it says, for Dr. Edward, and I walk in there, and 
There's my outfit, a white coat like some of you have on. And we go on the set, and if you've seen the movie, they're filming that scene where William Hurt's surrounded by his residents walking down the hall. And they film it two, three times, and I say to my wife, I wonder what we're doing here. And Randa Haynes, the director, comes up and says, I know what I'm going to do with you. And she seats my wife with her back to the camera, and she says, your husband's a patient in the hospital, and Dr. Ed, she seats me facing the camera. You're going to be telling her about her husband. William Hurt's going to come along and touch you, and you're going to raise your hand and say hi. See, that's your line. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we filmed that, would you believe it, 31 times. <laughs> we survived the cutting room floor, and if you blink your eye, you'll miss us. But in due course, I got a check for $431. <laughs> Now, what happened is, after the movie is completed, they have what they call a cast and crew screening. And those people who have participated come in, and after the cast and crew screening, they said, would you stay in L.A. for some publicity? And I stayed in L.A. for two days with television and newspaper. Then they said, would you go to New York for us for some publicity? And I went to New York, and I came back to Portland, and I was just besieged with requests for newspapers, television, and speaking engagements. I think last year, we traveled 55,000 miles. We even went to Paris where I was on a French television show talking on the importance of humanism and medicine, showing that the problem is worldwide. Apparently we touched a nerve. But I want to show you some of the scenes from the movie and briefly discuss them with you. So let's start the cameras rolling. When the movie was completed, Ed Feldman, who's one of the producers, called me and said, the doctors are going to love it. And I said, that's impossible. And he said, no, this is not a doctor bashing movie. We've gone all out for authenticity. And these scenes are very authentic, and I want to tell you about them. If you sit through the whole movie and look at the credits, they use 16 MDs as technical consultants and six RNs. And the ancillary people are all doctors and nurses in real life. Now, William Hurt and his cardiac team, before they did this part, attended nine bypass operations. And any cardiac surgeon will tell you that he's handling those cardiac tools, surgical tools, as a master. They also had a medical illustrator spend three months in a cardiac surgery room in Long Beach, California. So the music you hear there actually comes from that cardiac surgical room. And she brought that joke in about the lawyer, because that's what they said there. Now, I'm fascinated. When I was on the t first television interview, they said, which scene do you like the best? And I said, Nancy, the nurse who won't sing. <laughs> and I was fascinated by her because she appeared in the third script. And I said to Randa Haynes, who was the director, where are you going to find this talented person whose face is covered and has to show that she's being harassed? And she said, we already have her. She was a nurse in that operating room. And they got that idea because in real life, she too wouldn't sing with them. Now, does anybody want to tell me why or guess why she wouldn't sing? She's very religious. And listen to the music they're singing. Why don't we turn around and screw? And she wouldn't sing that song. Now, you'll also, if you've seen the movie, she sings later on. But you'll see that she did it very reluctantly. And it was only after they said, hey, you don't get paid and you broke your contract unless you sing, that she finally sang the song. <laughs> Uh, now, the next scene, I want you to, this is something that we all do and don't think about. Go ahead. Do that, you'll have to reverse it too. We do that oftener than we think. We are really not sensitive to what the patient is saying. And I, I tell this own story in my own family. My nephew Tom's a neurosurgeon. And I was standing by. He went to see this man the night before. The man had a brain abscess. He happened to be an attorney. And the patient with the brain abscess says to him, Doctor, are you worried? And Tom said, not the least bit. But then he says, on the other hand, if I had what you had, I'd be scared stiff. <laughs> so we do that very often without thinking. And we have to be very careful. Now, I'm going to show you the next scene only to prove to you. It's going to be even a flash here. Only to prove to you that I had a cameo role. OK. <laughs> This, you know, when I started medical school, the 
professor of anatomy. They used to try to, 25% of our class was doomed to flunk. That was a, it was, they would deliberately stress you. And the professor of anatomy would start his talk by telling us how terrible it would be to be a doctor. You'd be in bed, it would be a cold night, you'd be snuggled up to your wife and you'd get a telephone call and have to leave and that's what a life of a doctor was. As you go along in medicine, you are going to get telephone calls at inappropriate times and you will think that they're ridiculous, such as at three o'clock in the morning the patient calls you and says, I can't sleep and wakes you up to tell you that. <laughs> that happens all the time. But what you do is you have to look deeper because there's a deep hidden meaning in what the patient is asking you. And here's one of the examples in the movie. He's going to get an inappropriate telephone call and they're both going to think it's hilarious. Okay, let's show it. Well, they asked me a lot of questions. I gave them a lot of advice. They never did anything I told them. Now, here's a story I wanted them to use there instead of that. This was a true story. The patient, her husband had just had a bypass operation a month ago and she called me up and she said, can we have intercourse? And I said, how long is it since the surgery? She said, four weeks. I said, yes, it's okay now. She said, but he can't. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, he can't get it up. And I said, well, wait a minute. How long before the surgery was it before you had intercourse? She says, well, we haven't had intercourse for 10 years. <laughs> so I said, well, why, why now? She said, well, you told us that he could have intercourse four weeks after the operation. <laughs> but I, I, I still don't know why they didn't use my story. <laughs> now, I told you, going around the country, talking to different audiences, I learned a lot of things. One of the things that was most disturbing that I learned was that lay people think that we are arrogant. And I'm going to show you an example. This is a scene in the movie where the doctors are going to learn what it's like to be patients. And that's taken from real life. There's a hospital in Long Beach, California, where they start their residency by entering the hospital anonymously for 48 hours. So that's where they got this idea. Now, I personally begged them, I hated this scene, I begged them not to run it. But they didn't listen to me. They've run this scene. I have been at lay screenings where the audience actually gets up and applauds this screen. So they were right and I was wrong. Now let's look at the scene. Patients resent. They resent waiting, and that's a story. And it's one of the things that I was surprised at was they resent the short hospital gown. I describe in my book, and it was a tongue-in-cheek cheek thing. I describe how the gown is too short and the vital parts are exposed. But I, as a doctor, thought I knew why we had to have the short gown so we can get to them quickly and we can examine them quickly. I was therefore surprised how the public accepted it. Shortly after my book appeared. I accompanied a neighbor, and I, no one knew who I was then, I accompanied her to the doctor. He was going to tell her about her breast biopsy, and the nurse proudly showed me a new gown they had designed that women could wear and walk down the hospital hall without being embarrassed. I even had a proctologist send me a design, he'd, a gown he designed. He said that he could do a proctoscopic examination without embarrassing the patient. How that can be done, I don't know. <laughs> but it's surprising how resentful the public is of that short gown and how many hospitals are changing the gown largely because I started it in the book. The other thing that patients resent are bills. Now I can tell you this. I as a doctor had never gotten a bill until I had my biopsy. When I had the biopsy for a half day in the hospital, I got a $3,000 bill. I couldn't, under, I couldn't believe it. But the other thing is I couldn't understand what some of the items on the bill were. And this is a true story I told you about my nephew, Tom, who's a neurosurgeon. Tom had operated on a man who was six foot two, weighed 220 pounds. The man called him up and said, doctor, I've got my hospital bill, I can't understand it. Tom said, bring it in, and I'll go over it with you. So the man says, what's this item, type and cross match? Tom said, we had blood standing by in case of an emergency, that's type and cross match. The man said, that's legitimate, I'll pay for it. And the man said, what's this third, second item? And Tom said, that's an antibiotic. You were asleep. I gave it to you intravenously. The man said, that's legitimate. I'll pay for it. He said, but what's this third item? Vaginal pack. <laughs> Tom said, well, what happened is you had developed bleeding during the operation. I called for a narrow strip of gauze, and that's what the nurse handed me. The man said, I'll pay for the, everything but that item. Let him sue me, and let's see what will happen. <laughs> 
From the doctor's point of view, uh, I had lunch with a doctor who's head of the Nebraska State Medical Society. He's an internist, and he was telling me he got a call one day from one of his elderly patients. She was having abdominal pain. He thought it merited a house call. He went out there, he saw her. She had a perforated appendix. He sent her into the hospital, and she did have a perforated appendix, and she had surgery. Medicare refused to pay that claim. They said that uh, it's something he could have done over the telephone. If he'd have sent a visiting nurse, she'd have been able to collect $60. The next day, my doctor friend called a plumber. The plumber wouldn't even come out to the house to give him a 60, uh, for $60 to give him an estimate. So that's the doctor's point of view. I, I like this story. I had a patient come into my office and she insisted she had fatigue and she wanted a shot of B12. That's the only thing that helped her. I couldn't talk her out of it, so I finally gave up and gave her a shot of B12. And I submitted the bill to Medicare and Medicare turned it down. Well, I knew the arbitrator at Medicare. He was a doctor friend of mine. So I wrote him a letter and I said, Dear Clint, I know that B12 will not help fatigue. You know that B12 will not help fatigue. The problem is that the patient doesn't know it. So will you please write her a letter and explain to her why it doesn't help? Now the other problem is this. When she got her B12 in Palm Springs, California, Medicare paid for it. But you won't pay for it when she gets her B12 in Portland, Oregon. So will you please write and explain to her why it works in California and not in Oregon? He, wrote, he called me up and he said, Ed, why don't you go to hell? <laughs> <laughs> a, a lot of people will say there's no relationship between a book and the movie. But here's a good example of where the relationship exists and a good example of why a book and a movie are entirely different vehicles and the genius of the people who make the movies. Now, in this particular scene, June who's a patient dying of a brain tumor, and William Hurt, who thinks he's dying of throat cancer, run off to escape into the desert and have this dance. That's the scene. And people will say, is that in your book? Well, June is in my book, when, and she was a doctor's wife in whom they'd missed a the diagnosis of brain tumor. And then I describe on how my last day of treatment of radiation therapy I think that maybe I'm going to make it, at least I feel some hope, but I know that she's not going to make it, and how she comes into the examining room and she removes her bandana and I see her bald head. But to me as a cancer patient, she's not ugly, she's still beautiful. And this is the way they handled it in the movie, it shows you the genius of Randa Haynes. And also, I want you to see the genius of these actors. Look at the expression on William Hurt's face when she removes the bandana. So let's roll that scene. When I, people, some woman in the audience, if I open it up to questions, will always embarrass me by asking, did you really have an affair with June? And I always say, well, gee, I can't answer it. My wife's in the audience. But we could spend an hour just discussing as to what was going on there. I want to conclude by telling you what it's like when you think you've had cancer and you see a glimmer of hope. And to understand what I'm going to read to you, you have to understand that at the end of my treatment, just like it was in the movie, my vocal cords were swollen, I couldn't talk, and in order to communicate with my wife, I wore a whistle on a cord and I'd blow the whistle. That's the only way I could talk to her. And this is what I wrote the day after Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is the holiest day in the Jewish religious calendar. That's the day when man stands before God, announces his sins, asks for forgiveness. And at the end of the day, the books are closed and it is inscribed what will happen for the year. Who will live and who will die and who shall fail and who shall prosper. And this is what I wrote. It is the day after Yom Kippur and I did not like the rabbi's sermon yesterday. He spoke of the biblical allowance of years, three score and ten. I've already reached that point. My wife, Dee, awakens me. What do you want to do today, she asks. I look out. It's gloomy and rainy. Nothing. What did you say? Nothing, I repeat. Say that again. Can't you hear I snap? 
Say it again and again, she laughs. Your voice is back. I repeat the words and listen to myself. She is right. For the first time in months, my voice sounds almost normal. I have been inscribed for another year in the Book of Life, I tell Dee. It is still cloudy and rainy, but we go outside and hold hands in the rain. For we now see that autumn is not a time of death, but of harvest and rejoicing. The Oregon rain after a dry summer is liquid sunshine. It promises rejuvenation and a renewal of life. And let's look at it this way. It is now eight years since I had radiation therapy for cancer of the vocal cords. If my grandfather would have had my illness, he would have died of it. If my father would have had it, he'd have had his laryngectomy, his voice box would, re would be removed. He would be alive, but he wouldn't be able to talk. It's now eight years, and I'm here with you, and I'm alive, and I'm talking to you. We, we, we have just a few minutes if somebody wants to discuss something or raise a question, we'll be very happy to do it. <laughs>